This video is all about I squared C. I squared C is a protocol used for sending data back and forth. It's also called I2C or TWI, which means two wire interface. Um, and it's super common. It's used all over the place and we're gonna dig into the details in this video. So let's get started and just, just to show you how common things re it really is, if you just go on DigiKey, for example, and search for I2C, you get 100,000 results. If you search for USB, you only get 49,000 results. So I2C is more common on DigiKey than USB, which is interesting. Um, and it's used for all sorts of parts on DigiKey. There's, you know, it's used in microcontrollers all over the place. Um, it's used in different memories, have I squared C interfaces, um, temperature sensors have I squared C interfaces, data acquisition, analog digital converters use it all over the place. So it's, it's used in a large number of parts, especially integrated circuits or ICs. And that's why we're going to talk about it today in detail. So at a block diagram level, um, you know, there is the simplest implementation of I squared C is this. There's one master and one slave. There are two pull up resistors pulled up to some voltage and there's two pins, which makes it extremely attractive from a pin count perspective because there's just two pins. Uh, there's SCL, which is your clock and SDA, which is your data, serial clock line, serial data line. So your clock line, all it does is send ones and zeros out to tell uh, the, the slave when to sample the data, and the data is what actually sends the information. So the clock is used for uh, aligning the data so that the slave knows when to sample it. There's also these two pull-up resistors here, and I'll get into the details of how exactly those work, but just know that, that they're out there and they're pulled up to some voltage. Now you can also have multiple slaves on a single bus, which makes it very attractive for uh, interfacing a lot of different integrated circuits that do a lot of different purposes. So for example, you might have an analog to digital converter, ADC slave, that uh, sampling some data out here, and it's digitizing that data and sending it back to a microcontroller, or UC here. That could also be an FPGA. Uh, some sort of smarts is going on here that's telling the ADC to go sample, gets the data, pulls it back inside, and then it does what it wants with the data. You could be driving a DAC, digital to analog converter. So you could be sending commands to a DAC to say, go to 3.2 volts, go to 1.7 volts, and the DAC will interpret those commands, and it will drive its DAC logic and drive whatever analog voltage you request. You could be communicating a different microcontroller or a different FPGA, for example. You could have a slave microcontroller sitting out here on this bus as well. And all of these uh, are have this shared bus, so every everybody sees everything on the bus, but there's, uh, and there's ways to handle the interfaces between multiple things talking at the same time, and I'll get into the details of that. You'll notice here, I just want to point this out, that you don't duplicate on a hardware on a hardware level. You don't duplicate the pull-up resistors for every single slave that you add to the bus because that would effectively put multiple resistors in parallel uh, for one for all the slaves that you have, and that would decrease the overall res resistance. If you have resistors in parallel, that equivalent resistance is smaller, so then those resistors don't work as well, um, or they work better, actually. Um, they, they pull harder, uh, so that would cause a problem. So you just have the one pull-up resistor for your entire bus. Uh, one for clock, one for data. So let's talk about some advantages and disadvantages of I squared C. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an interface to send and receive data, um, and one reason why you might want to use it is it's super low pin count. So if you're really I.O. constrained, you don't have much input output on your microcontroller or your FPGA, whatever it is, you might want to look at I squared C just to save some pins. Um, another nice feature of it is that there's addressing built into the interface, as opposed to something like UART, uh, where if you want to talk to multiple things, you have to build an extra layer of addressing on top of it, this protocol layer on top. I squared C has addressing built into the spec, and I'll get into exactly how that works in a little bit. And it's super ubiquitous, as we talked about. It's everywhere, and um, that is extremely nice if you just want to have one interface talk to a bunch of different ICs, and you know that all those ICs are going to be able to talk and work together. Some disadvantages of I squared C. It is, it is half duplex, so half duplex itself um, means that you're kind of limited on your, on your overall bandwidth, so how much data you can send in a second. So uh, most I squared C interfaces are limited to 400 kilobits per second kvps. I say sorta because there are other I squared C interfaces, uh, other I squared C revisions that can go faster than that, but they're relatively uncommon in the real world, and I'll talk about some of those caveats later on. Uh, but 400, 400 kilobits per second is, it's not as fast as SPI, but it's faster than UART. 
So those are two other protocols you might be considering. Um, it's a it's a decent data rate. You know, you can't get really high sampling off of like an ADC, for example. You might want to use SPI for like some really high speed ADCs. Um, but it's fast enough that if you're doing some temperature sensing, things like that, you should be fine. Um, it does require some careful consideration of hardware. So those, that's just, you need to know where the pull-up resistors are. And you need to make sure also that when you're picking parts that the addressing doesn't collide. Because addressing is important. Um, and so if two slaves have the same address, they're both going to be like, oh, you're talking to me, let me talk back. And boom, that data will collide on the bus. Uh, I think that'll become clear as we talk in the details. And it's it's more complicated than SPI or UART. Those are both, you know, being a half duplex interface means you have to handle a lot of corner cases. Like what if two things start talking on the, at the same time on a shared bus? That's co a collision on the bus. You don't know what's going to happen necessarily. So that's a complicated, um, that just adds more complications just right there. Uh, the fact that addressing is built in is a little more complicated. Um, so that's the, that's the negative, which if you're designing this in a microcontroller, most of the core has already f figured out some of those details for you. So it's usually not too bad. Um, if you're designing it in a micro in an FPGA by yourself, you have to deal with all those corner cases on your own. Okay, let's talk about the hardware. Uh, this is worth mentioning internally. How does I squared C work? It is called an open drain interface. Um, not super important if you understand the details of MOSFETs or BJTs, bipolar junction transistors, but what effectively is happening is there's this, let's, let's take the master side. Um, there's a switch inside of here. Well, let's, let's take a step back actually. Master and a slave talking back and forth to each other. There's a clock and a data line. I have chosen just to show one path between master and slave. So let's assume this is the data interface, for example, but the clock looks the same. Uh, so imagine duplicating the circuit uh, below it for, for a clock. Uh, but let's just look at data. So you want to send some data. Okay, if the switch, the switch by default is open on both sides, master and slave. If the switch is open, then this plus V pulls this uh, the voltage on this bus up to its up to its voltage. So if this is 3.3 volts, you have a 4.7k pull-up resistor here. That means the voltage on this node here at the bottom of the resistor will be 3.3 volts because this is just a floating. These are not connected. This is all just floating, and these will all be 3.3 volts. So these master and a slave both see a logic one on the bus. Okay. Now master says, "I want to send a zero on the line." Well, you'll notice there's no but there's no driver circuit. On this, on the master. If you look at the block diagram, this is a this is a buffer, and it's it, it's in it's pointing this this way this way. Am I mirrored? Anyway, it's pointing like it's receiving data. Um, so that means that it's not driving anything. This particular triangle is a buffer. It's not driving anything onto the line. It's receiving stuff from the line. So how does it drive? Well, via this switch here. This switch in the real world will be a transistor of some sort, MOSFET or a BJT, probably a MOSFET. And what's going to happen is when you want to drive a zero on the line, you actually just close this switch. When you close the switch, what happens? This makes a connection. This is ground. So this pulls this line down to zero volts, which means that the bus now becomes zero volts. There's going to be still your 3.3 at the top of the resistor, but across the resistor, the pull-up resistor, there's going to be a small voltage drop uh, of 3.3 volts. This will be at zero. There's some current flowing into it. Anyway, uh, the slave is going to see that same zero over here. So now the slave goes, aha, I received a zero. Okay, interesting. And it'll, it'll this buffer will receive that zero, and it'll go to this logic decode circuit and process that, that data. If the master wants to stop driving, it will simply open the switch. It doesn't drive a one. If it wants to stop driving a zero, it doesn't actually go, okay, here's a one. I want to put a one on the line. It'll just stop driving this switch closed and let the switch open itself back up again. The switch will open up that this pull up resistor will pull the line back high again. And now you have a one on the line. So by default, the bus has a one, you, the master or slave can close that switch and pull it down to zero. So it's an open drain interface. You, um, by, and by pulling, um, by closing a switch, you're pulling the bus low. Same thing, clock and data. Okay, next, let's look at the data. So this clock and data, you want to send data from a master to a slave or read data from a slave and pull it into your master to do something with it. How does that work? Let's talk it through. Boom. You got SDA and SCL, clock and data. Now clock's on the bottom, data's on top. 
There is something known as a start condition in I squared C. That happens when data goes low and then a short time later clock goes low. So that this is initiated by the master. The master always initiates the start condition and that that tells the slave start paying attention because somebody's going to be talking and it might be to me. Could could it be somebody else, but it might be to me, so let's 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 pay attention here. Okay, we're in, we're ready. Here comes the address. That's the first thing that happens. So the clock just toggles. Boop 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 and it and the slave uses the clock to sample the data line. When the, when the clock is transitioning low, that will tell the slave interface, okay, go ahead, data's on the data's on the on my SDA and it's valid, so go ahead and sample it. Now if you've never seen this before, um, what this is showing is uh, some bits on the SDA line. It's, it looks like they're high and low at the same time. In reality, it's either or. It'll be high or low, but this is just showing that you can have a one or a zero for the, your address bits. So you have seven address bits. A6, A5, A4, A3, A2, A1, A0. So you can have up to, well, if every address were usable, 128 addresses on your bus. Not every address is usable, some are reserved, so there's a less than 128 interfaces. 128 would be a ton of ICs that you're talking to though, so you usually only need one, two, three, maybe four, um, and again, you need to make sure that these addresses don't collide. So you gotta make sure that your ADC is at a different address from your DAC, is at a different address from your IO expander, for example. If they do collide, then you're gonna have a problem because they're both gonna think, you're talking to me. And they'll both respond and they'll collide. It's a shared bus, so collisions will happen. Okay, so you've sent your particular address bit. The slave says, oh, he's talking to me, I better pay attention. Okay, what does he wanna, does the master wanna write to me or read from me? And that's determined by this eighth bit here in the beginning, of the, in the first word or, or byte uh, that, that the master sends. So a one on this eighth bit indicates a read command, meaning I want to read data from you, Mr. Slave, and Mr. Slave. And a zero uh, indicates that you want to write data to Mr. Slave. All right, next. The slave, if there is a slave that is out there and if it properly decodes the address and says, yep, I understand everything that you just told me, it will pull the line low. This, 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 it's hard to tell who's driving the line in this, in this black diagram here, but this is, this act is the slave going, yep, sounds good. It'll pull the line low by, by closing that switch. And that's the act of the slave saying, gotcha. The master sees the act because it's a shared bus. Everybody sees everything on that bus. And so the master knows that the slave is ready for the data. Here we go. Uh, we didn't specify, I, it's hard to tell if this is a, let's pretend this is a write command. So we're writing data to the slave. Okay, so here's the data that we're writing. The master is pushing, so now the master is pushing the data on the line, or pulling the data, I guess, pulling, flipping that switch to drive a one or a zero. Data is always eight bits wide, so there's there's your byte that you're sending. You want to send some byte to do something. Cool, cool, cool. The slave will say, uh, now it's when, when the command is written, uh, then the slave will acknowledge the command and say, I understand everything you're saying by pulling the line low. Again, low is ack. And that is how data is written. If this were a read command, you'd be, uh, you'd tell the slave that you want to read some data. And then the slave would read whatever data was in its buffer ready to be read. So this would be the slave driving the interface uh, on a read command. And at the end, we have a stop condition, which is the opposite of a start condition. Um, clock goes high and then SDA goes high after that. And that is the indication of the, the uh, entire command is complete. So this is the complexities associated with I squared C. This is why it's it's a, it's a complex interface because there's a lot going on here. There's a start condition, a stop condition, a read write bit, an act bit, you have to do address, then data. And there's all sorts of different things about like corner cases to I squared C, which I will talk about now. Okay, if you're not confused yet, just wait. It's possible, let me talk through each one of these individually. I'm gonna talk through each one of these. These are uncommon scenarios and I'm gonna focus on the common interface to try to just keep things simple, but these are other things you might want to do with I squared C. So it's possible to connect two different IO voltages without buffers or level shifting, but probably don't do this. So in the example back 
uh, let's see. Here, um, if you wanted to, if you want to run your master at a different voltage from your slave, so if this is running at 3.3 and this is running at 5 volts, you can actually do that with I squared C because in order to drive a zero, it just needs to pull it low, pull it low, and you can still receive, you can still receive data. Uh, most of the time, sometimes maybe. Anyway, it's possible, it's uncommon, and I don't generally recommend it. If you want to run a master at 3.3 volts and a slave at 5 volts or some other voltage, I generally recommend that you buffer the signals and do a voltage translator to do that. Um, but it's possible you don't have to. Resistor sizing, you do need to pick a resistor size. I just use 4.7K, that is super common, and I don't ever have a problem with that. But if you have really long runs, uh, maybe 4.7K is not enough of a, of a resistance. Also, to confuse you further, there could be 10-bit addressing sometimes. 10-bit, um, if, if you just run out of space, if you use all, uh, whatever, 100 plus addresses and you need more, uh, there's 10-bit addressing available. I've never seen that because that's a, an insane amount of addressing. Um, also, if 400 kilobits per second is too slow for you, which is the fastest common speed of I squared C, you can get faster than that. Uh, one megahertz, 3.4 megahertz, and five megahertz are possible. But the I squared C interface changes from this uh, pulling effect with that switch closing to more of a driving effect. Anyway, super uncommon, probably don't use it. Also uncommon for multi multiple masters. So we in, in the block diagrams we showed earlier, here we go. Uh, we could have a microcontroller master and another microcontroller master on the same bus. It's possible to do that. And most implementations will support that. However, it is relatively uncommon for that to happen, but know that it's possible. And it's, the specification will uh, talk through how to handle, you know, it, imagine a scenario where two masters immediately start talking at the exact same time. Which one actually has control of the bus? There is a bit that is defined in the specification, the I squared C spec. And so you can, uh, you can look that up. And another uncommon thing, clock stretching. Clock stretching is possible. So if the if you want to read data from a slave, for example, from an analog to digital converter, and the ADC is not ready for some reason, it can actually hold the clock align low and tell you, give me a second, I'll, I'll be right with you, Mr. Master. Um, and the slave will just uh, stretch the clock out and delay things. Again, uncommon. Most slaves are ready to go when you ask them to go. I think that's more of like an 80s thing or a 90s thing when maybe your integrated circuits were just a little bit slower, you need a little bit more time. Nowadays, it's relatively uncommon. So these are all these are all rare things. You don't see these super often. Most of the time, it's one master on a bus, more one or more slaves that the master is talking to. It's talking, each slave has a seven bed address and it's talking at 100 or 400 kilobits per second. That's that's the most common wet use of, of I squared C. Um, Again, it's a uh, really ubiquitous interface, super handy for talking to small integrated circuits. And uh, in the future videos, I'm gonna talk through the implementation of an FPGA design using I squared C. So stay tuned for that.